In this video, we're going to introduce antioxidants and talk about the role of both oxidants and antioxidants and how they're kept in balance. We're going to describe what oxidants are and what processes they arise from. Then we're going to distinguish between two systems that control oxidant stress, an endogenous antioxidant system and dietary antioxidants. We're also going to discriminate between the roles of vitamin C and vitamin E in reducing the potential damage from buildup of oxidants. There are several oxidant species, but the most important ones biologically are reactive oxygen species. This is when an oxygen molecule has an extra electron. For example, if you compare oxygen to the superoxide anion, there's one extra electron on the superoxide anion. This is unstable, and that anion is going to want to donate that electron to another molecule. It could donate it to a lipid, a protein, or DNA, and in all those cases, will modify that molecule and could cause damage to that molecule and eventually to the cell. However, these oxidants are generated by normal metabolic processes. For example, a small amount of superoxide is generated every single time oxygen is reduced at the end of the electron transport chain. This is a normal process. Generally, about 2 to 4% of total oxygen molecules become superoxide anions. And this is an important process because this is one of the ways by which the muscle adapts to increased stress and activity. Without that, training would be less efficient. In another example, in the innate immune system, when the body comes across an invading pathogen, one way by which it can destroy that pathogen is to engulf it and then intentionally generate a lot of reactive oxygen species, which can then go on and destroy the pathogen. Again, if there's an inability to generate these reactive oxygen species, our innate immune system is less effective. However, these can build up, and if you have a too much of a buildup, it can be very problematic to ourselves. Therefore, we have endogenous systems to ensure that they're not built up too much, and they're kept in good balance. The first of these systems is the endogenous mitochondrial antioxidant system. It can take reactive oxygen species, such as superoxide anions or hydrogen peroxide, and convert them to less toxic products, such as molecular oxygen and water. The first enzyme is superoxide dismutase. It takes the superoxide anion and converts it into molecular oxygen and hydrogen peroxide. This hydrogen peroxide can then be reduced further to water using either catalase or glutathione peroxidase. Glutathione peroxidase works by recycling a particular molecule called glutathione, here shown as GSH and GSSG. Glutathione can cycle between its oxidized and reduced form and can help with getting rid of excess hydrogen peroxide. Interestingly, these molecules contain several micronutrients that we've not yet discussed. For example, one of the isoforms of superoxide dismutase requires manganese as a cofactor. Glutathione peroxidase requires selenium as a cofactor. Therefore, if you're deficient in selenium or manganese in your diet, over time, that could affect the ability of superoxide dismutase or glutathione peroxidase to effectively reduce antioxidants. That's one reason why sometimes people refer to selenium as an antioxidant. The other system by which we can control oxidants is our dietary antioxidant system. The two most important molecules here are vitamin C and vitamin E. Vitamin C is soluble, which means it lives in aqueous environments and can scavenge excess reactive oxygen species from aqueous places. Vitamin E, on the other hand, is lipophilic. That means that it resides in membranes. It can interact with peroxidated lipids, shown here as LOO dot, and reduce them back to their normal form. It can then pass its extra electron back to vitamin C, where it can be safely disposed of. Diets that are deficient in vitamin C or vitamin E can often result in excessive oxidant damage. So what goes wrong if you are deficient in, for example, vitamin E? Some of the phenotypes of vitamin E deficiency are muscle weakness and a loss of muscle mass, neurological problems, including sensory problems and vision problems, and hemolytic anemia due to the death of red blood cells. Pause the video and think for yourself, why might these pathologies be associated with increased oxidant stress? Let's go through a couple of examples. In the eye, when the eye encounters light, there's a lot of reactive oxygen species that are generated by that light harvesting complex. Therefore, the retina is very, very sensitive to oxidant damage, and a high amount of vitamin E is required to ensure that the eye is not damaged by too much light. On the other hand, if you think about muscle cells, muscle cells have a lot of mitochondria. And again, mitochondria are the source of a lot of superoxide anions. Therefore, 
those mitochondria need to have vitamin E in their membranes in order to make sure they're not damaged by that buildup of superoxide anions. Damaged mitochondria can cause muscle weakness because you can generate less ATP, and then over time, a loss in muscle mass. There are several other dietary antioxidants, for example, vitamin A, lycopene, lutein, and flavonoids. These all play slightly different roles and have slightly different specificities and locations in the cell, but they're generally present at much lower levels and as such are less important than vitamin C and vitamin E. In summary, oxidants are generated intentionally. This is a normal part of growth and metabolism and is important for both muscle adaptations and immune function. However, a buildup of antioxidants can cause DNA damage, protein damage, and lipid damage, resulting in impaired cellular function. Therefore, oxidant levels must be tightly controlled, and there are two systems to control it, an endogenous system containing catalase, superoxide dismutase, and glutathione peroxidase, and dietary antioxidant system, especially vitamin C and vitamin E.